Okay, we are live. So, first of all, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today again. Um, já estamos ao vivo, então eu vou fazer uma breve apresentação em português para a gente começar. E depois apresento o nosso convidado. Uh, então, boa noite a todos, né, a todo mundo, a todos, a todas, a todes. Nós somos o Grupo de Estudos em Linguagem e Cognição Incógnitos, do IEL, do Instituto de Estudos da Linguagem da Unicamp. É, e estamos aqui fazendo mais uma atividade do nosso grupo de pesquisa, que esse semestre está discutindo questões relacionadas à consciência, né? Sempre relacionando a linguagem de alguma forma. E hoje a abordagem que a gente trouxe é a abordagem dos sistemas dinâmicos, né? E vamos para a gente entender um pouco melhor como que é essa abordagem diferente, né? Temos uma especialista aqui, a nossa doutora Josi, também do grupo, né? Aqui temos membros do grupo, o Fernando, a Tamires, Maria Eugênia e o Michael, que vai fazer a palestra para a gente, que é o um especialista na área de sistemas dinâmicos e vai explicar como é que funciona mais ou menos essa abordagem, né? Vamos fazer questões aí para ele também sobre como funciona essa abordagem, como é possível entender a linguagem enquanto um sistema dinâmico, o que isso significa, certo? Então, obrigada ao pessoal também que está aqui presente. So, now I'm going to introduce our guest, Dr. Michael Spivey. So, I'm going to read his mini bio and then we start, ok? Ok, Michael? Sounds good. So... Michael J. Spive is professor of cognitive science at the, at the University of California, Merced. He earned his BA in psychology at the, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and his PhD in brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester. After 12 years as a psychology professor at Cornell University, Spive moved to UC Merced to help build their cognitive and information science PhD program. He has published over 100 journal articles and books chapters on the embodiment of cognition and interactions between language, vision, memory, syntax, semantics, and motor movement. His research uses eye tracking, computer mouse tracking, and dynamical system theory to explore how brain body, environment, work together to make a mind what it is. In 2010, Spider received the William Proctor Prize for Scientific Achievement from the Sigma, Sigma Chi, okay, I forgot, Scientific Research Honor Society. And last year, he was inducted as a fellow of the Cognitive Science Society. His research program is described in his books, The Continuity of Mind, published by Oxford University Press in, in 2007, and Who You Are, published by MIT Press in 2012, 20. So, Michael, thank you so much again, and we start now. I'm going to remove our faces from here, but we, we are here in the backstage, and I'm going to add your presentation here. So. We see you soon. So, Fernando, Josi, Maria Eugenia. So, one minute. Okay. All set. Thank you so much again, Michael. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Tawani. Um, so, uh, this title slide is a little screwed up from the upload uh, to this platform. It, it's supposed to say in yellow print, uh, language as a dynamical system. And underneath that is my name and university, white on white text. I apologize for the, the technical difficulties for that one slide. It looks like the other slides, most of them at least, are going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be talking about language as a dynamical system today. Um, and a number of people have spoken about language as a dynamical system in the context of language learning. Uh, uh, work by Nick Ellis, Jeff Elman, Linda Smith, Liz Bates, and various others have focused on that. I won't be doing language learning today. People have also Uh, studied language as a dynamical system in the context of diachronic language change and the cultural evolution of language. People like Simon Kirby, Morton Christensen, uh, Whitney Tabor, Rick Dale. And again, I won't be talking about language evolution uh, in this talk either. I'm going to be focusing on language processing, uh, 
language comprehension in particular, and how it is well described as uh, a dynamical system. And so new insights can be uh, grasped about how language works when you look at it through the lens of a dynamical systems theory. But I'll start with the more traditional approach that some of you may be familiar with from mostly from the previous century um, in psycholinguistic approaches to language as a linear systems model with uh, an emphasis on representational units, thinking of what language does is it produces a representation in your mind that is a static structure held in some kind of working memory format. Uh, these would be the things in the mind, like when you hear a sentence, someone says, oh, there he goes again, Spivey waxed philosophical, talking on and on about uh, non-practical matters. When you hear a sentence like that, Spivey waxed philosophical, um, the traditional approach was to have a system build a syntactic structure loosely schematized here, um, a hierarchical structure that forms the syntactic uh, arrangements of those words. And that syntactic structure is treated as though it's something that sits in your mind statically as the thing that helps you understand that sentence. It's the representation in your mind, the thing in your mind. I'm going to do my best to expunge that way of thinking about language, at least for a little while during this talk in your minds. Um, okay, my animations aren't going to work on this, these slides either. And that's okay. <clears throat> so normally this slide would have had uh, just these boxes of a traditional approach with just the feed forward arrows. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, especially, um, psycholinguistics and a lot of linguistics treated language processing as this feed forward series of information transmission from a phonology box that only does phonology. And then that module sends its output to a morphology box. It's going to recognize the words. And then when that that box is finished recognizing a word, it sends output only to a syntax box, which starts to collect those words together and build a syntactic structure, a thing in your mind. But over time, over these in the 1990s and the early 2000s, <clears throat> and still today, people have been finding context effects where sometimes pragmatics can influence syntax, not just the other way around. Sometimes uh, pragmatics can influence syntax. Sometimes morphology can influence semantics or even phonology influencing syntax. These context effects kept accumulating in the literature, enough so that it makes it difficult to really see language as this set of modules where a syntactician could just study syntax because that's a module that only does syntax and doesn't have to process other things. So you don't need to, you don't have to know about semantics or morphology. The old phrase was take care of the syntax and the semantics will take care of itself. Well, as it turns out, most of these little areas, these areas of study or levels of representation have so much interaction with other areas that to study syntax, you probably need to know a little bit of semantics and even a little bit of pragmatic, pr pragmatics and phonology and morphology because that syntax box and the other boxes isn't just doing syntax. It's doing a little bit of these other uh, contextual influences because it has to be able to translate some semantics into having that context effect tell syntax what to do. Um, and so with this kind of collection of context effects, we start thinking about language not as a series of modules that are devoted to one level of representation and a different one devoted to another one, but in fact they're interactive enough. We need to look at them not as a series of boxes and arrows, but as parts of a network in a brain that has sometimes mixtures of processes in one brain region and mixtures of other processes in other brain region. And pretty much any two brain areas that are connected to each other are pretty reliably connected bi-directionally. So if lexical input is being, lexical processing is being influenced by phonetics, well, you can bet that lexical processing is also gonna be influencing phonetic processing right back. Those bi-directional connections are uh, all over the brain. Any, any two areas that are connected are almost always connected bi-directionally. But so we're moving away from that linear systems uh, feed forward box and arrow model towards something that's more dynamic, more network-like. And I'll talk about one of our findings right now. One of the findings that came out of uh, uh, my lab and my advisor's lab, Mike Tannenhaus, work done by Bob McMurray using eye tracking. So uh, Bob McMurray was a, an undergrad doing his senior thesis in my lab at Cornell many years ago. <clears throat> And then he went to do his PhD with my former advisor, Mike Tannenhaus. And so he was well-trained in the head-mounted eye tracking that Mike Tannenhaus and I had developed uh, shortly before that. 
with a head mounted eye tracker, you can figure out where people are looking in some complex scene. It could be a real 3D table or a computer screen with stimuli on it. And you can see what point in time the eyes are drawn to a particular object given a speech stream coming into them. Headband, headband mounted eye tracking uh, is extra useful for a number of reasons. Um, it provides a near continuous measure of where your attention is moving without interrupting processing, processing. You don't have to interrupt and get some metacognitive report of how they understood the sentence. They're pretty much going on autopilot, following instructions to move objects around on a screen or on a table. And, and once you've worn the helmet for you know 10 minutes or so, you can pretty much ignore that it's there. You get used to it and just go on autopilot, follow instructions. And every second we're gonna get three or four times, three or four data points of where your eyes have jumped. These saccadic eye movements happen about three or four times per second. So you can have relatively um, realistic, ecologically valid scenarios to collect your data on some kind of language processing in a visual context. But probably the key uh, point, the key emphasis uh, for why eye tracking is informative is that saccades are, for lack of a better term, promiscuous. They have a low threshold for execution. That is, when some internal preference or bias or maybe representation gets only partially active, that's still enough sometimes to draw an eye movement to the object in the, in the external environment that corresponds to that partially active representation. If you think of it in terms of a dynamical system, you might imagine a vector field uh, for dynamical systems where this would be a two-dimensional a manifold where a system starts in one location and these arrows show where that system would gravitate and move toward. So if it started here, it would run along this ridge and then settle into this attractor basin. Or if it started uh, just to the left of that ridge, it would run along to the left attractor basin. If you have a uh, um, strict threshold for an overt response, like naming that object or reaching out and grabbing that object, then you might have uh, these white uh, thresholds that are, you have to cross that white line in order to really fully commit to that interpretation. With eye movements, however, you can think of it as uh, wider uh, circles with a, a looser um, threshold for execution. So here's another way to envision that same thing. A, a, a system would be a little bit like a, the state of the system would be a little bit like a ball rolling along the ridge, maybe rolling toward the left attractor basin or maybe rolling toward the right attractor basin with just the tiniest bit of bias initially on one or left or right side of that ridge. In that uh, vector field description, this would be the thresholds for a saccade that the system might move from the lower portion with that yellow line up to the upper portion and it'll cross a threshold, even though it hasn't really picked a side, it hasn't started leaning toward one or the other of those two mutually exclusive options, it has crossed the threshold for eye movements. And so you'll see eye movements jump to those locations of objects that correspond to a partially considered option that might eventually get rejected and you'll choose the other one and you'll name the object based on the other attractor basin or a representation or reach out and grab the object. And your eye movements looked at the other object briefly, but then they made a corrective eye movement to settle on the right one. These big white circles are kind of a way to, to envision that uh, loose threshold for saccades that are more promiscuous. And then the system would eventually settle, the state of the system would settle into a, an attractor basin that fits one attractor, uh, one representation, and you settle into understanding the sentence or the word uh, or the phoneme as just that one thing. And that's what we're looking at is the phonemes here. We're gonna start with categorical speech perception, which of course Liberman uh, half a century ago demonstrated that we, you can take uh, speech tokens that are synthesized to be a really good ba with zero voice onset time. The moment the lips open, the voice, the vocal cords are already vibrating. That makes a good ba sound in English. And then uh, with 40 milliseconds of voice onset time, there's a gap between the, the lips opening and about 40 milliseconds later, the vocal cords finally start vibrating. You get the voiced, uh, you get the voicing of that vowel ah, but the uh, consonant itself, p, is an unvoiced, and so you have that 40 milliseconds of no voicing. You can synthesize, as Lieberman did, uh, speech tokens that are in between these two extremes and make sounds that are sort of in between a good ba and a good pa in English. And so that you might have a sound that's, I can't produce it perfectly, it'd be pa, ba, pa, somewhere in between here. And categorical speech perception has shown pretty much 
uh, all the tokens in one half approximately of that continuum will be strongly in, uh, perceived as a ba, and pretty much the other half will be fully perceived as a pa. You don't, even though these are slightly more pa-like sounds, you don't get a slightly increase, slight increase of pa-like responses. You don't get a linear reaction. You get this step function. But what Bob McMurray did with eye tracking was had people look on a computer screen at these icons and click one. And so the click would be that overt response that Liberman had already collected. But their eye movements would be that, um, that covert measure of where your attention is going, where your preference might be leaning over the course of several hundred milliseconds of making that decision. So they're told to fixate the central cross, then they hear a sound like ba or pa or something in between. And you look at where the eyes go before they finally click one of those response options. Mm -hmm. The final response replicated the good old fashioned findings of a nice step function. So it was clear that people were pretty much calling all of these ba sounds and all of these pa sounds. When you track the eye movements for a really good ba with zero voice onset time, you see the eyes pretty quickly on average after several hundred, several hundred milliseconds, they'll start settling all of them. This is many participants over many trials, average together. They will all settle on that ba icon and then click it. There'll be a few moments where a handful of participants might briefly look at the pa icon and then look back and then stop looking at the pa icon. So these, this is a, a brief glance toward the pa icon on a, on a handful of trials. With the really good pa sound, a good pa with 40 milliseconds of voice onset time, people pretty quickly all start settling their eyes on the pa icon. And a few times people will briefly glance at the ba icon, but not for much, not for very long and not many times. And one of those intermediate stimuli, the ambiguous stimuli that's not quite a ba, not quite a pa, it's 20 milliseconds of voice onset time, people tend to eventually land on the pa icon and 95% of the time they called this stimulus a pa sound. But on the way to doing that, they spend quite a bit of time Pretty much all the participants spend at least a, a couple hundred milliseconds fixating that ba icon. A lot of times people would fixate one and back to the other and back to the other and then finally settle on the pa and click it. And so this is one way to see that process of the system settling into one of those attractor basins, but this ambiguous stimulus essentially makes it run along the ridge equidistant from those two interpretations, those two attractor basins, for a long time. And the eyes are waffling back and forth, unsure which one of these options is right, and then it finally settles into pretty much the same interpretation almost every time, but it just took a while to get there. So there's your categorical speech perception at the final result. Um, but if you look at uh, early periods of time, you can see that that step function starts out being essentially a soft sigmoidal function. And that sigmoid expands over time as people are looking more and more at one option or the other option. Um, and finally settling on one of those options. Okay. Oops. So now I'm gonna extend to longer time scale now, not dozens of milliseconds of voice onset time being 20 or 40 or zero milliseconds. We're gonna look at not just an individual phoneme, but a whole word and see similar kind of phenomena happening here. <clears throat> And this is work that actually took place a little bit before that work with Bob McMurray. This is work that Mike Tannenhaus and, and uh, my colleagues did um, back in the previous century with people wearing a head-mounted eye tracker and you sit them in front of a real table with real physical objects. Um, that was a toy raccoon, not a real raccoon. We don't let the animals into the lab too much. Um, and so you give them a simple instruction like pick up the candle. You tell them fixate the central fixation cross, now pick up the candle. And uh, about a third of the time, people would make a first saccade to the candy. It's a little package of candy there. And then make a corrective eye movement to the candle. And this is because on the time scale of a few hundred milliseconds, that word candle is temporarily ambiguous between the names for those two objects, candy and candle. It's not ambiguous with parrot or a raccoon or, or beaker. But for these two objects, those first few uh, phonemes match perfectly well for either of those objects. And once in a while, the eyes will jump the gun and because they have a low execution for threshold, they will look at the wrong object. And then for 200 milliseconds, then, then they make a corrective eye movement. If you ask people afterwards, did you notice when I told you to pick up the candle, you looked briefly at the candy? Every single time they say, no, I didn't. Why would I do that? 
So these eye movements are, are a very quick and subversive measure of what your mind is doing, even more so than you know what your mind is doing. Metacognitive measures wouldn't have detected this. Without eye tracking, you wouldn't know that the reason they might be slow to finally settle on this, reach out and grab that candle, uh, is because they were distracted by the candy, which starts with the same first few phonemes. If you replace that cohort object, the candy, with a, a control object, like a pickle, now there's nothing in that display that starts with the same sounds of ka and and so people quickly make a, a fixation just on the candle, and, and they don't make too many incorrect saccades to other objects. When you pull the data together across candy and candle, penny and pencil, tower and towel, a bunch of cohorts, words that have uh, the target word being said, like uh, tower, and then a, another object like a towel is the cohort, with the, starting with the same first few phonemes. You pull all that together and you'll see, uh, after, see it after about a few hundred milliseconds, at the beginning of the word tower or candy or candle, people start looking at either the target object or the cohort competitor with about equal likelihood just on the tail end of hearing that word. And then a couple hundred milliseconds goes by and they gradually stop looking at the cohort object because they've now processed hearing that last couple of phonemes, which is inconsistent with towel, if you heard tower, or candy, if you heard candle. And people are gradually settling their eyes on the target object, gradually not looking at the central fixation cross anymore. And they settle on that target object, reach out and grab it. <clears throat> but this bump here shows that there was some partial activation of that alternative interpretation. When hearing candy, they were briefly thinking candle or vice versa. McClellan, uh, Jay McClellan and Jeff Ellman developed, again, many years ago, uh, a neural network simulation that has, is still the gold standard for a lot of these word recognition models, where you would feed it phonetic features in 10 millisecond chunks, and then those would activate phoneme nodes, which would then activate word nodes. And then there's feedback so that if a word gets partially active, it will send feedback to activate phonemes in it that it hasn't even heard yet. So it's already doing a kind of X, sort of a um, implicit anticipation or prediction of what it's likely to hear, given that this word got active and it's going to send feedback to all the phonemes that make it up, even phonemes that the system hasn't been fed yet. And it's going to get multiple words partially active. If you feed it k and then it's going to get candy and candle and candelabra maybe partially active. If you look at that activation level of, for the word nodes in this simple attractor network, you see activations like this when you, when you normalize them to sum to 1.0. That probability of fixation coming out of the model will have the spoken word get more and more likely to be uh, looked at and more and more active uh, in its activation. And the cohort object, like the candy when, when fed candle, will get partially active for a while and then ramp down. There's the human data. And there's our model simulation. I'm quite sure that this is the best model data fit I will ever get in my entire life. So I try to make the most of it. And it's a useful insight into the kinds of mechanisms that might be involved in real time language processing that has a, a temporal dynamics to it, a little bit like what that attractor network is doing. Now, of course, you don't have word nodes in your brain. You don't have individual neuron devoted to the candle representation and another individual neuron devoted to the candy representation. If you look at a network like this and squint just right, you can imagine that what you actually have is each of these nodes at the word level or phoneme level has underlying it a population of neurons that work together as a coherent representation, a group of neurons that get partially active and then more and more active if, that, if their appropriate input is feeding to them. And so those population codes for this node or for that node would be what a real brain is doing. You might have a population code like these neurons for the word candle, and then another population code like these neurons for the word candy. It would be more than the 20 that I've highlighted here in this toy cartoon, but just to help think about the actual neural dynamics underlying this kind of dynamical process, um, we're going to draw 20 or so neurons for one population code because I it's probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands for any given word recognition event um, and I wasn't going to draw thousands of little diagram little neurons here 
So we'll pretend it's about 20. And so there's your candle population code and here's your, sorry, here's your candy population code in red and here's your candle population code in green. And what happens over time is as you start to hear the word, you get 100 milliseconds into hearing ca. If you freeze frame the brain, all you've heard so far is ca. The word candle takes about 300 milliseconds to say. You're one third the way through it. You've heard ca. Freeze frame the brain. What's it doing in this dynamical account? Well, some of the neurons in your candle population code are active, and some of the neurons in your candy population code are active. Another 200 milliseconds goes by. If you freeze frame the brain and try to cartoon imagine what's going on in that brain, you're going to have a little more activation in the candle population code because you've started to hear the old part. And then at 300 milliseconds, that candle population code is mostly active. It's not fully completely active. And then at 400, it gets fully completed. You've uh, fulfilled that population code and you recognize the word. And candy starts to ramp down in its activation, the competitor cohort. If you were actually stuck a bunch of electrodes into those particular neurons and you somehow magically knew that those were the right neurons to measure from for this population code, then you'd have a, a bunch of neurons out of these 45, uh, about a third of them, that have very high spike rates, right? If you were recording from this brain that understands the word candy. And of those same 45 neurons, there'd be another group of them that are really active for candle. There's a few of them in common. So a few of these neurons are the same neurons. And that's because they're participating in parts of those two words that are the same, the k and the a parts. And that's a partial overlap among those two population codes. As that word unfolds over time, what these neurons would be doing if you were recording from them in a, in a real brain would ramp up gradually these spike rates, these activations of those neurons over time to fulfill the population code. This is the same thing as talking about the state space in a dynamical system. So if each of those 45 neurons in this little pretend toy network we're playing with, if you treat each neuron as a dimension in the state space, then you've got a 45 dimensional state space. Can you imagine a 45 dimensional state space right now? Give it a try. See, imagine that 45 dimensional, no, you can't, I can't either. Well, imagine a three dimensional state space and just keep telling yourself that it's 45 and that system is moving around in that high dimensional state space as it changes activation rates of those neurons, each of those neurons is a coordinate value. And so as it changes from that activation value to this activation pattern, that's moving from one location to another location in the state space to yet another location and finally settling into an attractor basin that belongs to that location. And if you did some powerful dimensionality reduction, you could see a two dimensional projection of that 45 dimensional space where there'd be one location for one of those interpretations of candy and another location for the other interpretation of candle. And the system would move in a nonlinear trajectory toward the center, toward the midpoint of those two locations first, and then settle into one of them once it gets enough information. Sometimes this dynamical systems account is described as a metaphor, a new metaphor for how the mind works, rather than the box and arrow metaphor that cognitive psychology gave us in the 1980s and 1990s. Now we have a different metaphor that's not box and arrow, it's a dynamical system metaphor. I want to suggest that metaphor is probably not the best way to think about what a dynamical systems account is doing. And, and it's, it follows along this way. So if you imagine that there are cells um, at time T1 and time T2, maybe this is 100 milliseconds, 200, 300, and 400 milliseconds of some actual neurons getting partially active as they hear the word k and d -ol. Then at the first 100 milliseconds, you get some partial activation, you get more activation at 200, and then eventually, after 400 milliseconds, you get mostly just the neurons corresponding to the word that was spoken that are active, and the other neurons that correspond to a similar word are less active now. If you were recording from those actual neurons getting firing rates, you'd get bar plots that look like this over time, just describing that neural data. It's not a metaphor. These are just data, point, uh, data reports of, instead of colors for how active those neurons are, these are values of spike rates for how active those neurons are. So there's nothing metaphorical there. It's just a data description of what that neural system is doing. If you had a localist attractor network that's essentially pretending we can have one number 
that tells us how active that population code is, and another number, another node that tells us how active the other population code is, then on that third row, you'll have activation of two nodes, one, both of them getting partially active initially, and then eventually one's getting very active, like the candle, because that's the word you heard, and candy stops getting active and starts to reduce in its activation. That's what the localist attractor network was doing, the simulation from McClellan and Elman. And the same thing can be done with a mathematical description of what's going on in that neural system with those spike rates. When you look at what is a 12 dimensional system in the uh, actual, this little, these, you know, dots of, of yellow and orange, that those 12 neurons for a, a tiny peek into a pretend brain, that 12 dimensional system has regions in it, locations in that state space that correspond to one population code attractor basin and another population codes attractor basin. And what the system is doing when it's producing patterns of activation that get near both of them initially and then finally only into one of them is really moving around in that 12 dimensional state space, which you can make a two dimensional projection on it so you can visualize it, get a data visualization of that high dimensional system. And it would produce a trajectory that moves toward the midpoint initially on the bottom row here, and then eventually curves toward one of those attractor basins settling into it. So that dynamical systems account of this neural system here in this little toy scenario isn't metaphorical at all, really. It's just a mathematical description, a data visualization of the real phenomena, the actual activation patterns, the actual spike rates just described in a state space. It's a data description, not so much a metaphor. Um, okay. So uh, in addition to eye tracking, um, we have this another way to study this kind of phenomena um, that's become popular. We developed back in 2005. One of the weaknesses about eye tracking is that on any given trial, you either fixate the, uh, the cohort object and then correct your eye movement to the right object, or you don't. And so on individual trials, you don't see this graded temptation the way a trajectory might do in a state space. You have to pool the data together and it's, it's binomial data be the on any individual trial any any individual trial you looked at the competitor or didn't with a mouse a computer mouse you can get individual trials to show you that graded temptation toward uh, one interpretation that gets corrected for a different interpretation you can see the non-linear trajectory happening out in the real activity space so we gave people instructions like click the beetle on a computer screen and they had a picture of a beetle, also a picture of a beaker. And here's a picture of an actual trajectory sampled at about 30 Hertz of a mouse movement that moved toward the midpoint of those two locations and then finally curved toward the other one. They heard be beetle and moved toward the midpoint of beaker and beetle and then made a, a, a nonlinear curve settling into the right one. When you average these trials together, you'll you find that uh, when the cohort competitors present, like pickle, when told click the picture, you'll see the, the cohort condition is the open symbols that curve a little more toward the competitor object. And in the control condition where the pickle might be replaced by a spoon that doesn't sound anything like picture, you have uh, less curvature in that mouse movement. So this is a way to sort of see that nonlinear trajectory happening in a two dimensional activity space it gives us a peek into that high dimensional, billion dimensional brain space that has attractor basins for a candle or a candy. And that curved trajectory in their actual behavior may be uh, an, e an emission of a release of the data from that brain system that's moving around in that state space, initially toward the midpoint of those two objects because it's hearing uh, two, it's hearing cat and that's consistent with both of those interpretations initially, both of those attractor basins. Okay, now I'm gonna take another step to be even further along in time scale to uh, uh, several seconds um, of hearing a whole sentence. And in sentences, of course, we have temporary ambiguities, just like we saw halfway through a word or even partway through a, a phoneme. Partway through a sentence, you can have syntactic ambiguities like this. <clears throat> where as you hear uh, someone say to you, I bought the sword from, 
um, incrementally, your system will, in, you know, will develop some kind of internal patterns of activation that are consistent with treating the word I as belonging to a noun phrase that belongs to a sentence. And then you hear bought. So you know that's a verb in English. You're going to start developing some kind of neural activation patterns that are consistent with something like a syntactic understanding of this verb is part of a verb phrase that's part of the sentence and attached that also has a noun phrase to it. And then you get the direct object of that verb, the sword, and then you get this ambiguous preposition that syntactically could be telling you more about the sword. It could be a noun phrase modifier attached to the noun phrase saying, I bought the sword from World War II. Um, so it's clearly a, a sword that has a particular property about it that is World War II-like. Um, it could also just as easily, this prepositional phrase that's just beginning, attach to the verb phrase telling you more about the buying event. It could be a verb phrase attachment telling you, I bought the sword from the pawn shop. At that point in time, halfway through this sentence, there's no way to know which one of these syntactic structurings it's going to be. And your brain has to process that temporary ambiguity. It's like moving along that ridge in that attractor basin space, that uh, attractor landscape, and trying to settle toward one or the other, and it doesn't know which way to go because they're equally possible. Same goes for an even simpler sentence like put the apple on. That prepositional phrase on could be telling you more about where the apple currently is or it could be telling you where you're supposed to put it. And that syntactic attachment ambiguity was used in this experiment. Uh, again, Mike Tannerhaus and I did many years ago with instructions like, put the apple on the towel in the box. And we recorded people's eye movements while they carried out these instructions. Uh, we have an unambiguous, syntactically unambiguous control sentence, put the apple that's on the towel in the box. In both cases, on the towel is supposed to be attached to the apple, telling you where the apple currently is. And the prepositional phrase that's telling you where to put it comes after that. But there's often a tendency to interpret on the towel as, as attached to the verb, a verb phrase attachment bias, statistically speaking. If you have a one reference context, so there's only one apple in the display, we use real 3D objects, real apples on real towels and stuff. Um, and in a one reference context, so there's only one apple, people frequently would look at that apple upon hearing put the apple. They hear on the towel, and then they look to that other towel. Then they hear in the box, they make a corrective eye movement back to the apple, grab the apple, put it in the box. But something different happens when you change the visual context. All of a sudden, the exact same sentence, put the apple on the towel in the box, that has that syntactic ambiguity in it. Now, in a different visual context with two apples, upon hearing put the apple, people start making eye movements to the two apples back and forth pretty quickly. And then they hear on the towel, they settle on this towel that has the apple on it. And then they hear in the box, reach out, pick up that apple and put it in the box. They rarely, only occasionally look at this irrelevant towel in this two reference context. So when there's only one referent, you get this garden path effect of briefly treating on the towel as the destination. And this would be the towel uh, in the one reference context. The top right towel would be the irrelevant towel that's in briefly interpreted as a destination. And all we did is add one more apple. And the visual context made that garden path effect go away. So here's a, one way to plot those data of, when there's one reference context, people would look at the apple, and then a, a little more than 50% of the time, they would, a little more than half the time, they would look at that irrelevant towel for eye movement B, and then make a corrective eye movement and carry out the correct action. They didn't misunderstand the sentence by the end, they didn't carry out the wrong action, but that brief temporary uh, syntactic ambiguity produced a kind of brief garden path effect of their eye movements, showing that they were briefly interpreting on the towel as a destination. And there's a, a bunch of different displays with bowls and, and candy bars and other things too. So it's not just one particular display with one sentence. Yeah, I had a video to play that didn't get uploaded properly. So we don't need that. It's okay. I'm, I can describe this for you without the video. Um, and so when there's two reference, the exact same syntactic ambiguity winds up not producing a garden path. People tend to look back and forth between the two apples, and then they hear uh, in the box, and they move the apple to the box, only occasionally looking at this irrelevant towel. And the data look like this, where in the two reference context, where all you did was change the visual display, they occasionally look at that irrelevant towel, but with no difference between the ambiguous and unambiguous conditions.
So these looks aren't due to the syntactic ambiguity. In the one reference context, so there's only one apple, that visual context caused people to experience this brief garden path. And they looked at that irrelevant towel 55% of the time when the sentence was ambiguous. When it was unambiguous, they never looked at it. So it's clear that the syntactic ambiguity is what's causing them to look at this irrelevant towel most of the time. A garden path effect, like so many garden paths, of, so many garden path effects have been found in, in sentence processing research, but this one is being manipulated to appear or disappear based on the visual context. So those context arrows I was showing you between uh, portions of the language system, between pragmatics and syntax and other areas, this is one of those context areas between something like visual context pragmatics and syntax. Visual context can tell syntax what to do once in a while. Okay, so let's look again at this uh, landscape uh, way of thinking about what the brain, what the mind is doing as it settles toward one attractor basin or the other attractor basin. With phonemes and words, those are always the end of the stimulus. And so it kind of made sense to have these be attractor basins where the system settles down into one or the other and kind of sits there at least for a couple seconds while that trial is finished. By contrast, with sentence processing, you're usually getting another word, then another word, then another word. And so you don't have that syntactic ambiguity halfway through the word, half, sorry, halfway through the sentence get resolved and you settle there. When you wind up resolving that uh, way to process this prepositional phrase, there's more words coming near the end. There's a, maybe another, a second prepositional phrase. And so thinking of these as attractor basins where the thing settles and stops doesn't quite work for natural language and, and, and sentences even. This is a slide from Jeff Ellman, which Looks better when animated, but uh, the great, the late great Jeff Elman gave me this slide um, years ago that uh, shows just the word cuts initially. And then you see the word boy as something that could precede that verb cuts, and then paper as something that could follow it. And so if you think of cuts as a location in that state space, this is your meaning of that verb to cut. And it's a, it's a little bit like an attractor basin in that uh, landscape, but it doesn't settle into and sit there. It attracts things there to the meaning of cut and to the verb argument structures of cut and the syntax constraints of cut, and then goes somewhere else. So it's kind of not an attractor basin that settles into, but a attractor basin that goes there and then goes somewhere else for the kinds of direct objects for a cutting event, which are pretty varied, right? If it's a boy cutting paper, then that direct object is paper. It's going to be a particular kind of cutting event, probably scissors. Whereas if it's a lumberjack, you hear someone say, the lumberjack cuts wood. Upon hearing cuts, you're processing cuts a little differently. And certainly by the time you hear wood, it's a different kind of cuts. So that notion of a dictionary definition of what cut means doesn't work too well here because there's scissors cutting and there's act cutting, and they're pretty different actions. They take, they tend to have different uh, uh, subjects and they tend to have different objects, a wide variety of them. So this slide works nicely with the dynamical systems account. If you think of a state space, um, call it a, a, a billion dimensional state space, but we'll make it a, a three dimensional so we can visualize it. There would be a region corresponding to your understanding of that verb cut. And that region might initially be imagined as precise and defined. And when you hear the word cuts, your brain goes to that region of state space. It produces that pattern of activation for that word. But there are shadings of meaning with that. There could be ax cutting or scissors cutting. It could be cutting meat or cutting wood, etc. And so that variety of trajectories that go through that cuts uh, location could be uh, the boy cuts paper is one of those trajectories, and the surgeon cuts the steak at the restaurant is another of those trajectories. And there's subtly different kinds, shadings of meanings. And so rather than being a, a strict definition of this is the uh, region for cuts, you want to kind of blur that out and allow for different kinds of meanings, even metaphorical meanings. Maybe on the fringes of these set of circles would be a metaphorical meaning like, um, uh, those words really cut into me, where there's, there's no physical cutting happening, but it's a, a figurative meaning of the word cut, and it's going to use the word cut, so it's going to be near, maybe on the fringes of that. Um, not a tractor basin, but a kind of attractor and repeller. It attracts 
things that start with the boy or the surgeon or the lumberjack, and then it repels toward things like uh, paper or wood or steak. So if you blurred out that attractor basin into being something like a, a spatiotemporal hourglass, where systems are attracted to, from various regions, types of cutters will move into that region for cutting, and then types of cutties, the direct objects are, of cutting events are tend to be out here. And hearing the lamp, lumberjack cuts wood or the boy cuts paper is gonna involve zipping through that uh, trajectory that zips through that uh, spatiotemporal hourglass in slightly different regions of the pathway for different shadings of meaning. So if I say to you, do you understand? You might, I might have in my uh, brain space, an attractor basin and, and repeller portion for the word do, and then the word you, and then the word understand. In order to make my articulators produce those words correctly and not slurred and screwed up, I've got to pretty precisely visit that attractor basin and repeller to produce that word do correctly and then produce that word you correctly. By contrast, for you comprehending it, when you hear me say, do you understand? I might say it quickly. You might be barely paying attention. Your trajectory doesn't have to be as precise because you're not producing motor articulations. You can be approximate in your understanding, maybe metaphorical in your understanding, and get close to that attractor basin and repeller, uh, but not perfectly visited. And that trajectory that never quite perfectly went into those symbolic representations, because that's not what they are, it never quite got there, but it got close enough that this trajectory of your brain producing patterns of activation that change over time, that trajectory is your understanding of my question. Do you understand? That's one way to think about this um, dynamical systems approach to understanding language processing. That's very different from imagining that there are things in the mind, that there, when you understand something, you produce a static representation that sits still in some working memory uh, arena that's a thing held in your mind when spivey waxed philosophical. Instead of it being a thing in your mind, it's, it's a trajectory through your brain space. You hear the word spivey and you get a pattern of activation corresponding to a particular location in state space. And then you hear the word waxed and your brain has to produce a change in those activation patterns, which is moving to new other regions. It's not going to be able to teleport there. Groups of neurons ramp down and other groups of neurons ramp up. And so it's moving into intermediate space to eventually get to a region corresponding to the word waxed which kind of has two meanings. And so that's why has, there's two lobes on that attractor basin, essentially. There's waxing like a moon waxes and there's waxing like you wax your surfboard. Uh, we're talking about like the moon waxing. And then the, the sentence continues with the word philosophical and your brain space has to move to another. Your state of your brain has to move to another region in this space. So your understanding of a sentence like spivey waxed philosophical, yet again, is a trajectory through state space. It's an event over time. It's not a static thing that is generated and held in working memory the way you might design a computer program to do. So you might say, okay, fine, Spivey, I guess the sentence is a trajectory, an event over time, but those little locations you drew for these words, those are locations that when you visit there, that's instantiating a static representation of visiting that attractor basin, right? We've got that location for waxed. If we zoom in on that region of state space for waxed, we'll find just like with the uh, candy candle effects, there's a temporal dynamics to understanding an individual word as well. It's not an instantaneous effect of producing a symbolic representation that sits still in your working memory. It's an event over time, a trajectory of visiting that phoneme, then this phoneme, then another phoneme. Now, of course, this is a billion dimensional space. So when we project it onto just two dimensions, that's why we can make it look like these phonemes live inside that one verb. But of course, they don't live only inside that one verb with many, many dimensions. This would be, they, they live uh, inside many different words. But from this two dimensional projection, you can see it's going to be a trajectory over time that has you understand the w and the a ah and the x sound over time, just like we saw with the eye movement data for candy and candle. You might say, okay, fine, Spivey, I guess words are, are events over time too. They're trajectories through the state space. They're not symbolic representations that get generated and held in working memory as a static thing in the mind. Well, at least those phonemes look like they're things in the mind, right? You visit that one, then you visit the other one. 
as we saw with the Ba Pa continuum, there's a temporal dynamics. You zoom in on those phoneme effects, and you'll see there's a temporal dynamics there as well. There's a trajectory through that space of simply understanding the 75 milliseconds it takes to say whoop in the word waxed. Whoop is that brief little phoneme that comes to you, and you're going to have a temporal dynamics to understanding that that we saw with Pa and Ba when you start messing around with its uh, uh, voice onset time to get a continuum, you can see that, that it's not an instantaneous generation, instantaneous categorization of this sound into one phoneme or another. It's a gradual process, like a trajectory through space, an event through time. All right, now I've got a few minutes to touch on some cool things about more recent findings that I think is really the future of where language research, language processing and language comprehension research is going. Um, it has been going for a little while now, is more ecologically valid scenarios of multiple people talking, sometimes more than two, I'm going to focus on dyads here, that are well described, again, by a dynamical systems approach that looks at systems that now, it's not just one brain having trajectories through its state space, it's two brains that are coordinating, making a very high dimensional state space. They get coordinated in a way that they can be described sometimes as one trajectory through that conjoined state space. Um, this is one of my favorite studies is by uh, Anna Kulin uh, Alefeld and, and uh, John Dylan Haynes from a decade ago now, where um, they recorded EEG signals from a person telling a story. And this would be a female telling a story, just an uh, unscripted story of her own about her autobiographical event. And they record her EEG. They also record her face and her voice. And then they have a, a male speaker do the same thing. And then they make a conjoined stimulus of two sort of ghostly overlays with the two faces. You can, you can still sort of see the female and the male if you focus just right. And the two voices are also overlaid. So these two listeners are each over many, many listeners over, trial, over different uh, days of running the experiment. We'll watch that conjoined stimulus. And one of them might be instructed to pay attention only to the female speaker and her story. The other listener is told to pay attention only to the male speaker and his story. It's a little tricky to do it initially, but you get used to it and you're able to ignore and tune out the other speaker. And sure enough, the EEG signal out of the person listening to the female speaker, his EEG signal is more correlated with that female speaker's EEG signal than it is with the male speaker. Same for this person, this participant who's told to listen to the male speaker and pay attention to him, his brain activity is correlated with that male speaker's brain activity and not so much with the female speaker's activity. These peaks and correlations happen with a, a couple seconds of lag for understanding a couple words in a row. And they also have a pretty strong high correlation peak um, with a 12 second lag, maybe as a, a collection of a sentence or two building a situation or a story so that uh, the speaker is thinking about an event and then delivering a sentence or two about that event. And then the listener has heard those two sentences and now they're thinking about that event 12 seconds later. And those neural activation patterns are correlated because they're thinking about the same events with just a 12 second lag. Um, also my uh, former grad students, Daniel Richardson and Rick Dale did some eye tracking to show people get correlated in their eye tracking movements, in their eye movements. Um, they had someone tell um, an unscripted story about their favorite episode from the TV show Friends. And the speaker is looking at these six faces while they tell that story. And the listener could be days later, puts on their headphones, listens to that, that mono, uh, monologue story, and looks at the same display of objects. There's no, they don't get to see where that speaker's eye movements were, but their eyes will tend to correlate with where that speaker's eye movements went. I'm gonna skip this um, cross-recurrence quantification analysis because I'm short on time. I don't wanna get into, de into fine-grained statistical details, but feel free to ask questions about how this cross-recurrence analysis is done. What it comes down to is a peak of coordination, a kind of recurrence of people looking at the same face at almost the same time. So the, there's about a one and a half second lag here where the speaker and listener are looking at the same face. The speaker looks at that face, mentions that name, the listener hears that name, then looks at that face. There's your second and a half lag. When they had conversational partners live, you got two rooms, uh, two computers, two eye trackers, and they've got headsets on where they're speaking with each other live instead of a monologue. 
Now that one and a half second delay is gone. Now the peak of their eye movement coordination of looking at the same things at the same times no longer has hardly any lag at all. They're tending to look at the same thing at exactly the same time while they have this uh, sort of uh, Wi-Fi conversation on their headsets about the sh uh, shared display. I think it was a Salvador Dali painting. There's even work with postural sway. Um, so uh, Kevin Shockley and colleagues did work where people are standing on a force plate under their feet. And when you're standing perfectly still, you think you're not swaying. There's a tiny little bit of sway. The center of mass just drifts um, uh, several millimeters uh, every, sec every few seconds or so. And so you feel like you're standing pretty still, but there's a tiny bit of postural sway going on. When people were facing each other and working on a puzzle together while they talk, that postural sway got correlated. When people were uh, even talking and not seeing each other, but talking about the same puzzle, that correlation was still happening. When they're talking with a confederate, C1 or C2 here, in the bottom half of this display, those confederate conversations, these are two people who are solving the same puzzle, but they're not talking to each other, that postural sway correlation went away. So these are just three examples of ways in which a brain and a body of one person having a conversation with a brain and a body of another person gets correlated with their sway, their eye movements, and even their brain activity. They're starting to behave a little bit like one system, one dynamical system that is uh, coordinated in a fashion to solve a puzzle or carry out a coherent conversation, maybe finish each other's sentences once in a while, as a good conversation usually does. So now with the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about what this means for intersection of minds. And I'm going to get into that um, sort of dynamical systems framework of talking about where the cognition is. And if two brains and bodies are having a conversation about a shared display, like a painting or a puzzle they're both trying to solve, they're coordinating in a way that, that makes that external thing, that environment, part of their cognition. Um, Randy Beer and his colleagues have talked about this, where the nervous system is a, is a system that's relatively compact and partially uh, bounded, but it's also surrounded by a body that is richly interactive. And so embodied cognition has shown many examples of ways in which your body is doing some of your thinking for you, not just your nervous system. So these bi-directional arrows show that that nervous system is embedded in a body that makes it often best studied as, as a brain and body, not just a brain. The same is true for the environment and the way in which you use objects in your environment, tools and toys you interact with, interfaces you use like a computer, um, your smartphone that we all are addicted to, uh, doing some of our thinking for us the same way our body does some of our thinking for us. And that bi-directional uh, connection makes some of the cognition that we think is happening in our brain is actually happening in our brain, in our body and our environment as well sometimes. Um, Sarah Cargill uh, and I once described this also as a way of talking about a language part of your brain and a vision part of your brain and a motor movement part of your brain are richly interactive with one another. Those boxes and arrow diagrams have to have arrows going everywhere inside that brain. But that same kind of bi-directional flow of information is happening between the brain and body and between the body and environment. So if you had that those sort of circle of where there's a brain circle and there's a body circle, let's put it in a three-dimensional space where the third dimension here of height in this thing is going to be the degree to which it's true that this material is generating mental activity. So stuff inside that smallest circle, that's your brain activity, your nervous, acti your nervous system's activity. That's clearly part of your mental activity, very much so. But also embodied cognition suggests that there's a fair bit of activity going on in your body, separate from your core nervous system, that is doing some of your cognition for you. So you might imagine um, a kind of manifold over that brain and body that describes the degree to which neural activity is 1.0 true, definitely part of your mental activity. Your body's activity, separate from your nervous system, is still going to be also maybe 0.8 true, 80% of the time, part of your mental content. And even objects out in the environment, like your smartphone when you, it's helping you look something up, or maybe a, a toy puzzle where you're trying to re remove a wire, remove a, a ring from some toy puzzle. The way you move that puzzle around, those movements with your fingers and the movements of the puzzle itself are doing some of your cognitive operations, experimenting with how to solve that puzzle. That stuff outside of your body, 
but it's performing cognitive operations. It's part of your mental content. It, let's call it 0.5 true sometimes. So 50% of the time, that object in your hand that you're working with or that computer in front of you has operations it's performing that are consistent with being part of your cognitive operations, part of your mental content. So this little Gaussian distribution would be a way to think about an extension of your cognitive apparatus, your cognitive, your mental content is extended a little bit out into the world. And my slides aren't going to work quite right. I guess the uh, the upload lost some of my um, transparency images. But imagine a second uh, distribution right next to this one that looks just like it, but they're close to each other. So it's two brains nearby one another. And they're talking, they're sharing information. Maybe they're working on a puzzle together. Now you've got one distribution that spreads out past one body and another distribution that spreads out past that other body. And those two distributions are partially overlapping because maybe that shared object that we're both looking at, a map we're both looking and pointing at or a screen that we're sharing and talking about at the same time, that external object is part of my cognition and it's part of your cognition. So our our distributions, our manifolds of mental activity are partially overlapping. We become one system a little bit. If you add time to that, now we're going to just have room for one dimension of space, one dimension of time, and the height dimension here is again going to be that sort of degree to which this is mental activity. And certainly uh, as the top pair of lines here would be one brain and body that over time moves a bit to the right and then stays there for a while, then moves to a bit to the left and stays there. And just in the middle of the display would be a, a brain and body that moves slightly left for a little while and then moves slightly right for a while and stays there. And then the third pair of set of lines is a, another brain and body that comes in slightly leftward to, to get close to that middle one. These are brains and bodies that are interacting with one another. If you have this extended cognition that we're talking about, that that the, um, the dyadic conversation literature is pointing us toward, this extended cognition having a kind of manifold overlaying, then the cognitive activity, the mental content that's happening here is kind of spread out everywhere in space and time. When two people get near each other and have a, a serious conversation over lunch, they might be completing each other's sentences for each other once in a while because they're really on the same page. They're on the same wavelength. And their extended cognition has become essentially one mode, one distribution of a shared system creating, co-creating a monologue. Not a dialogue. It's practically a monologue because it's one system kind of talking to itself. These two brains and bodies have become one system for a little while. And then they finish that good conversation over lunch and go elsewhere and have other meetings with other people. This extended cognition approach is a way to think about a dynamical systems framework where cognition doesn't have to be just neural activity. Cognition can be anything that is processing information that promotes um, adap adaptation of that organism in its environment. And some of those cognitive operations are happening outside in the environment, especially when people share words back and forth with one another, whether they're sitting next to each other talking or whether they're 6,000 miles apart from one another having a conversation. Um, that language is connecting them in a way that can make them become a little bit like one system. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It was great. Thank so you, let me remove this and gather the group back together. So, Fernanda, Josie. Hi. Hi. Fernando. Hello. Maria Eugênia. Thank you. Tamiris. Hi. So, <coughs> I'm sorry. We have uh, a few questions here. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of questions. A lot of questions. <laughs> time. Actually, uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, we, were, we are like, uh, Tamiris was like, oh my God. I don't even know what to ask, <laughs> but let's go. Um, let me start. I'm going to put the uh, the questions here on screen so you can see it too. Okay. Thank you. The first one from Le Leonardo, Leona Leonardo Cabral. So this is the first part of uh, his question. Okay. 
Can you read it, uh, Michael? Are you seeing it? Okay. Yeah. You, want to, okay. you want me to read it out loud? Or? No, oh, no. So, oh. uh, yes, so we have the, the first part. No results from neuropsycho neuropsychological studies speak against an account of languages as dynamical systems. As these systems are highly adaptive to environment and in constant develop, de development. So, wait a minute. Here. The brain region, regions and neurophysiological signatures associated to language are relatively stable across language and societies. So, is it okay? I'm going to it's an excellent question. Yeah, it's a very good question. So, it's especially relevant for language learning um, as brains uh, are acquiring language uh, from being infants to uh, toddlers to being adolescents. Language uh, learning is still happening even in teenage years. Um, and there is quite a bit of uh, similarity and stability across languages in the world, across the world, where it's mostly the same brain areas. And it's a wide variety of brain areas, importantly. It's um, uh, not just Broca area and Wernicke's area that are popularly studied. There's many other brain regions, including uh, regions in the right hemisphere, that form a pretty large expansive network of brain regions for uh, processing um, this language or that language or some other language. When people are bilingual, you'll see a change in that. So there's definitely an adaptability when you compare, say, monolinguals to bilinguals and even trilinguals. It's a different formation of that network. So there's a, an adaptability to your language environment that over time produces a kind of stable set of uh, network uh, structure in a brain. Um, and so that's once you've become a full adult and aren't trying to learn yet another language, um, there is some stability uh, in the structure of that network. But what I focused on today especially was the real-time temporal processing of language comprehension, where that network, even if it has become relatively stable in an adult language learner who's stopped learning new languages, that stable network is going to have exactly the kind of dynamics that I've been describing uh, today that is best described as a dynamical system. Thank you, Michael. So the next one is from Josie. Josie, okay. So this this question actually we discussed it a lot uh, in our last meeting, right, Josie uh, and people, because we were thinking about the the how how can uh, this account uh, make pre uh, what does it say about making predictions? So you know it, it, it's it's something uh, important for science. So. Uh, Spivey, would you talk about the predictions DST can make? Yes, you bet. Excellent question. So a lot of the predictions, a lot of the sort of first hand, first handful of predictions that dynamical systems makes with language have already been uh, demonstrated. And they are the kinds of context effects that I talked about today, a much wider variety. Um, we could teach a whole course on the kinds of context effects that have been observed in uh, language processing, whether it's context effects on syntactic processing or on word recognition, etc. cetera. Um, traditional models with the uh, box and arrow approach from the 1980s and 90s, they did make a prediction that those context effects should be at least much delayed and maybe even completely absent. And dynamical systems approaches said, no, those context effects should be there. You just need to look a little harder. And so people did. They made, you know, uh, imposed more constraining context, stronger context, and recognized that just because you manipulate one context in your experiment doesn't mean that there's a bunch of other factors that you haven't controlled necessarily. And those other factors might be influencing what's going on. You need to try to control all those factors in an experiment and, and make sure you know that these potential context effects over here um, are, are held constant while you manipulate this other uh, context effect over there. And then you'll see effects that look like um, a, a syntactic process is pretty much immediately influenced by discourse context or, or semantic context or visual context, same with word recognition, et cetera. So that's one, one set of uh, uh, predictions that dynamical systems theory has been making about language processing for years, and they have borne true. Um, and they've helped uh, set aside the traditional linear box and arrow approach um, as a theory that's not fitting these new data very well. Um, and as uh, the previous question had pointed out, there's other predictions that dynamical systems theory makes, not just about context effects in real-time processing, but also um, in language learning and in language change. One of the key things I think that is common across language processing, language change, and uh, language learning 
that a dynamical systems theory will make a prediction about is that when you transition from one state to another state, whether it's recognizing one word and then the next word that's spoken, or maybe it's um, a, a word changing its meaning over decades to some other meaning in diachronic language change, or maybe a child developing some structure landscape uh, for understanding this new word they've learned. That change in a, a dynamical systems theory approach is going to be continuous and nonlinear. It may have sharp, it, it's not going to be necessarily smooth, it may have sharp turns here and there in its continuity, but it's not going to be a teleportation of suddenly instantaneously something stops being meaning one thing and now it suddenly means another thing. Um, it's going to have to travel through the intermediate meaning space, whether it's recognizing one word or the next word or a word changing its meaning over decades. And it's going to have um, a nonlinear path as it does that traveling. Those are predictions that um, have been sh bearing true in a handful of approaches. Whitney Tabor does some fantastic explorations of dynamical accounts of language change using um, those curved trajectories through state space where when a word used to mean one thing and now it means something else, over the course of a hundred years, how it got from there to here, it did some funny things in the way it was used. Wow, very nice, very interesting. Thank you. The next one is from Fernando. Fernando, are you there? So Fernando- You want me to- Ask him. Ah, okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is actually a sort of a selfish question because it's related to what I'm studying right now. Uh, but uh, what be the nature of those lexical items? I think you partially answered that. But uh, when we talk, when we're talking about lexical access, uh, would it be possible to access or to activate only a few features of a word during lexical access in a sentence context? Yes. Um, so uh, in the Jeff Elman example of the verb cuts, for example, um, the verb cut has a handful of semantic features to it. Uh, and some of them might even be mutually exclusive for different kinds of cutting where, you know, uh, in one cutting with an ax, you'd be uh, doing a full body motion. Another cutting with scissors, you'd be doing just a, a one hand action. And those would be semantic features of, of that kind of event that are mutually exclusive, either using your whole body or using just one hand. Um, and so in that state space where you've got your definition or your meaning of the word cut, it's going to have shadings of meaning where if you visit that attractor basin for cut over here, then you've got the, the one handed scissors cutting kind of feature. If you visit it over here, you've got a whole body um, ax swinging kind of uh, semantic features. And it's going to be sent sentence context that precedes that that can help you get those shadings of meaning. Um, when, you, when you use the phrase activate the features, the dynamical systems framework would encourage you to, to make sure you're not thinking of them as, um, uh, as a box that gets checked. Did this feature get active? Yes, it's checked. Did this feature get active? Yes, it's checked. So when you move into that shaded region of cutting that is a, a, a full-bodied axe swing, it's still kind of close to that other shaded meaning of using a one-handed scissors cut. It's not that that one handed scissors cut feature is off. It's just only slightly active because you're slightly near it. You've moved to a location state space that is kind of close to a scissors cutting because you heard the word and you and, and you so that um, that feature of a, a one handed scissors cut when the context told you, no, this is a two handed full body X swing. Um, right. That feature is still slightly active of, of a one handed scissors cut. Uh, so, uh, would it be possible to to visualize it? I'm not. I'm not sure. That's like a good question. But to to test that, or uh, have we done that already? Uh, yeah, I think um, there's a lot of the work in um, uh, context effects for word recognition, especially with ambiguous words, where you you know you, you get a word that has two very different meanings, like bug is an insect or a spy device. Um, and uh, with the preceding context, you can bias one set of features or another set of features of that, that speech sound bug. Um, and in the more recent work, uh, people have shown that you can get, especially when it's the more frequent and common meaning, uh, you can get a context to pretty much only activate that meaning. It's going to push so far into that region of state space for bug. And because um, these aren't shadings of meaning, right? This is a fully ambiguous word that is 
uh, those two meanings are, are not near each other the way cutting scissors and cutting with an ax are kind of near each other. But a, uh, an insect and a spy device are pretty far apart from another in semantic space. There's a, a word bug that kind of tries to hold them all together. And if you give a strong context, it's going to push you toward only one of those, then you'll get mostly only the meanings of that word activated and not so much the other one. Um, so there's uh, work by Kawamoto doing uh, a neural network simulation of that kind of process of activation of features. Um, there's um, a lot of work by uh, the more recent stuff is Vu, V-U, and Kellas, K-E-L-L-A-S, uh, that showing that you can get these. And, and Patricia Tabossi has done work also showing that you can get these pretty specific feature activations of ambiguous words where the two meanings are pretty far apart in semantic space. Um, but a dynamical systems account can accommodate those extreme uh, ambiguous cases of two very different meanings and polysemous meanings and shadings of meanings all in one framework without having to, to make, you know, one kind of mechanism handles the very different ambiguous words and another kind of mechanism handles the polysemous words. Instead, it's one system that's just got attractor bases that are sometimes near each other, sometimes far apart, sometimes conjoined with some undulations that give you uh, shadings of meaning. Very nice, thank you. So the next one is from Maria Eugenia. Maria Eugenia is here. So Maro, please. So um, thinking also about my, my own research, like Fernando, I, I would like to know what are the implications of this theory to experimental linguistics? And because considering this amount of variables acting on language while it's being processed, how can we make experiments that are representative of real life situations? Ah, yes, that's an excellent question. So um, it's very difficult to somehow balance the need to control your stimuli extremely well and make sure frequency values are similar and, and semantic and imageability is similar and all that stuff. And then still somehow have a spontaneous, natural, unscripted conversation be the ecologically valid thing you're studying. Um, one thing that I think has helped a lot is eye tracking. Um, where uh, work from Mike Tannerhouse's lab and uh, many of his students, Sarah Brown Schmidt has done a lot of this work uh, using head mounted eye tracking in um, natural unscripted conversation scenarios with displays of objects in the visual world paradigm as it's called. Um, and what you, you have to collect a lot more data uh, in order to, to select situations where you did have frequency effects not being responsible for your differences or imageability effects or whatever it might be that you want to worry about. You got to collect a whole lot of data and find the subsets of events when people are having unscripted, realistic, ecologically valid situations, but you were tracking their eye moods, so you got a real time measure, which is important. Um, and then look at those scenarios. When Sarah Brown Schmidt did this with uh, people sort of uh, working on a shared task with objects and a, maybe a puzzle, I think it was, and she looked at situations when words happen to be cohort-like, like candy and candle. And she found that in those scenarios, the way a person and another person, a dyad, are interacting, they produce enough natural constraining context with each other, uh, looking at each other, pointing, sharing eye gaze, um, that you give them a word that is potentially a cohort ambiguous word, like candy and candle, they don't look at the distractor anymore in those contexts. Um, a lot of times the realistic scenario has had enough shared attention and shared context that you're not going to get um, tricked into accidentally looking at the candle halfway through the person telling you, pick up the candy. Um, and it's because this, all of these uh, contexts are now not being controlled by an experimenter who kept everything even and manipulated one thing. It's looking at naturalistic situations where there are so many variables that people naturally use and they're going to, use that context to help each other understand one another as well as possible. And a lot of times those ambiguities uh, that, that we're able to detect in the lab with carefully controlled situations don't actually happen in the real world because of context. It's, there are so many factors that people are taking advantage of to help each other be on the same page and not get confused even temporarily by a word like candle that could sound like candy. Um, so. Yeah, for someone who wants to look at uh, ecologically valid, spontaneous conversation, there's, you know, wonderful work from Herb Clark in the 1980s and 90s that had uh, 
conversations of people that are recorded and you look at the transcripts carefully, um, maybe look at some video recordings of their uh, gestures and pointings. Um, but if you really want to get some real time measures of what's going on, you need something like eye tracking um, uh, to, to get some uh, millisecond by millisecond evidence of how comprehension is proceeding between two people. Yeah, thank you a lot. So the last one, so uh, can we choose a last one? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, Josie, I think this one from Josie is very, is very good because it talks about um, <laughs> competence and performance. So it's something very <laughs> discussed here in Yale, Unicamp, and it's going to be very interesting to hear from you what, what uh, the DST account has to say about it. Yeah, I have a, um, a history of being very uncomfortable with the linguistic distinction between performance and competence. Um, um, I, I know I'm speaking to some linguists here, but uh, I, 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 will, I will be blunt um, that there's many times where um, linguists and psycholinguists with uh, linguistic leanings have too often, not every time, but too often used the distinction between competence performance as just essentially a wild card giving you an opportunity to disregard some experimental data. And, and I count the times when it's done. When, when the experimental data comes out in favor of a, linguistics, a linguist's theory, they won't say, oh, that's competence, that, that's performance, not competence. They'll say, hey, see that data supports my theory. And then some other data comes out that doesn't support their theory. And all of a sudden, competence performance becomes a useful distinction to say, oh, no, that's about performance. And I care about competence. <laughs> beware, beware when, when that's happening. That's using it as a wild card to disregard data that you don't like. And you shouldn't be allowed to ch cherry pick your data. There's more to it than that, though. I mean, there's certainly something of a sense of competence being something um, that's a little more uh, uh, as a... a a static structure of your knowledge. And you could imagine perhaps that that refers to the neural connectivity of your brain as a, uh, a static state of that network in your brain uh, for how you understand length for, yeah, for your knowledge of language, your competence, your knowledge of that language. And then when you actually use the language, you've got a bunch of external inputs that activate different patterns in that neural network that is a relatively stable in its structure. And then you produce outputs that, that fit some kind of uh, response to that uh, comment. And so it looks like performance that's resulting from activation patterns flowing through that knowledge structure network. And that's not a terrible way to imagine uh, thinking about competence performance. Um, but it's still the case that every time you're going to measure language, even uh, doing, um, every time you're going to measure some kind of language process even if you think it's measuring competence, your measurement of language competence involves performance. So when you look at a sentence and give a syntactic judgment about whether it's grammatical or not, your grammaticality judgment on that sentence involves processing that sentence with some flow, activation flow in that, that structure network. The way you read or way you heard that sentence is gonna affect the way you processed it. Um, if you read a sentence and, and decide, oh, that one's ungrammatical, and then someone says that exact same sentence to you with some prosody added, and all of a sudden, whoa, it sounds grammatical now, what does that say about your distinction between competence and performance? You want to chalk it up to just performance? And, and which one of those was the competence? Um, <laughs> every time you measure, when, when a, a linguist reads a sentence and side, decides, I'm going to make a gra grammaticality judgment on that, the process of reading that word and the next word and the next word and the next word, that process is performance. And so you can never actually get direct access to some notion of competence in a human's behavior with language, maybe with some neural network simulations or other kinds of uh, maybe a Bayesian network. Um, you could train that network on some uh, uh, language processing and then look at its connectivity and call that its competence. And without passing activation through it, it's not doing any performance, you can analyze it in a way that you might understand something about its competence. But it's, you can't do that with people because you can't carve up their brains while they're alive. But yeah, just yeah, my, yeah. my biggest, biggest point there is beware of that distinction between competence and performance. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's very complicated. It's a very uh, so have uh, Leonardo even said here. Uh, many linguistics are also uncomfortable uncomfortable with this separation. Yeah, we, we are. We are very uncomfortable and uh, in doubt about it because um, I don't think uh, it doesn't seem that uh, just to wrap up uh, that uh, GST operates with uh, binarisms. Is that so, Michael? Uh, uh, what would you say about it? Because we still, um, in some accounts, we still operate with binarism. So uh, competence and performance, uh, nature, culture, in, uh, and, and some things like that. So what would you say about it so that we can finish? Well, yeah. Dynamical systems, so more and more those binarisms like nature versus nurture, or, or uh, 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 you know, discrete distinctions between two concepts or whatever. Um, it's easy to find, especially in performance data anyway, easy to find examples of gradations between those two extremes. And certainly most of the language acquisition and language learning literature now embraces the idea that it's both nature and nurture. Um, and so building some kind of theoretical mechanism that is devoted to one of those things and a completely different theoretical mechanism that's devoted to the other of those two things is probably not a good way to handle these findings where it looks like most of the time these two pieces of a binary system uh, work together. And usually when you measure it, it's something happening somewhere in the middle of that continuum, maybe not dead center, but somewhere in the middle of that continuum. And a dynamical systems account is really good at handling a continuum. Can I just say something? <laughs> uh, I'm not a linguist. I'm a psychologist, so I'm new to the field, but uh, I think it's a really nice talk. I think it, it, especially the last part, uh, like Maria Eugenia and Fernando, I, I was also thinking about my research, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's really nice uh, because we, we are studying conscious, uh, consciousness, and so it's really nice to think about uh, how we interact with each other and and everything like this so thank you very much uh, for your talk i think it, it we will we will have a lot of discuss a lot to discuss in our group excellent this was my pleasure yeah so we we'll have to 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 end up our our talk but uh josie fernando maria eugenia anything else there's a lot else, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you are mute, Josie. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, we could we could keep asking questions forever, but unfortunately, we need to uh, wrap it up. And thank you so much. You're wonderful. We love to talk. <laughs> thank, thank you for the invitation, Josie, and everybody. Thank fun. you. Thank you, Michael. Very, very interesting, Michael. Thank really you so awesome. much. <laughs> and see you next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward for the next one. Yeah, Hoping for next time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. This is going to be recorded here in our YouTube account. So check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Fica aí para quem quiser ver depois. Obrigado, gente. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.